Biologists from Mexico's National Autonomous University have relaunched a fundraising campaign for axolotl conservation. In this video, we will cover the basic biology of the axolotl, the threats facing these animals, and the various recovery programs out of Mexico. If you grew up in the States like I did, you probably pronounce this species as axolotl. Through this video, I will be pronouncing it as axolotl, which is uh, the pronunciation underneath the original Nahuatl language. If you want to jump around the video, timestamps for the various sections are found below. Please like, comment, share, subscribe, do all those things that YouTubers tell you to do. Thank you. When we are talking about the axolotl, most of the time we are talking about this species here, Imbistema mexicanum, the Mexican mole salamander. This is a leucistic, this is what you'll see in the pet trade pretty often. However, in the wild they look like this. Absolute units. These salamanders are characterized by a neotenic state, meaning they are retaining the larval characteristics. As we can see from this figure here, many salamanders follow a life cycle of eggs to larvae to adults, much like um, frogs do. However, there are many species of salamander that uh, stay in that larval stage. These are referred to as neotenic. They are uh, staying in a larval stage. They are pedomorphic. They have juvenile characteristics through adulthood. Now, through this video, we are going to be assuming and providing information specifically for Imbistema mexicanum here, uh, the most stereotypical axolot, but it should be noted that there are many, many species that would be considered axolot. This is a good moment to illustrate how the common names for species are often quite loose and can apply to many different taxa. While we focus on Embistema mexicanum as the quintessential axolot, we will refer to axolots as any of the following species in the Embistema genus that uh, retain those juvenile characteristics. These species include the mountain stream salamander, Embistema altamirani, the blunt-headed salamander, Embistema amblycephalum, Anderson salamander, Embistema andersoni, the Lake Patscuaro salamander, Embistema dumeruli, the Lake Lerma salamander, Embistema lermaense, the classic axolotl, the Embistema mexicanum, the Puerto Ando stream salamander, Embistema ordinarium, the Michoacan stream salamander, Embistema rivulari, the Tarahumara salamander, Embistema rosaceum, the Durango salamander, Embistema sylvensi, Taylor's salamander, Embistema taylori, and the Plateau salamander, Embistema velasci. As a reminder, any of these could be considered an axolotl because they are all large embistema salamanders found in Mexico that have a neotenic stage. Several of these were uh, terrestrial and neotenic as well, so that's why you may have seen pictures out of the water. But out of every single salamander that I just listed, only two are not of concern for conservation. The rest are all endangered, critically endangered, or data deficient. But why are they endangered? Why are so many species of Oxolotl at threat of going extinct? Well, the threats actually go back much farther than people realize. This is an illustration from a wonderful article on the Chinampas, which are floating gardens from the Aztec people. These were floating on the shallow riverbeds of the Mexican Valley, typically wetlands and swamps. And underneath in these wetlands was phenomenal habitat for the Oxolotls. It should come as no surprise, then, that the axolotls are actually a central figure in much of Aztec culture. Their importance is clear in their very creation story. Pictured here is the god Xolatl, which is the twin of Quetzalcoatl. In order to escape being sacrificed, this dog-faced god actually disguised himself as many different plants and animals, the last being the axolotl. Of course, the axolotls are named after the god Xolatl. And many translations of Oshalal come out to mean water dog, which of course, dog-faced god, now in the water, the water dogs. Also, some translations put it as meaning water monster, just for clarity's sake. So even though the Oshalats are a culturally important species that no doubt coexisted with the Aztec people, the habitats that they used, as well as the Aztec used for the Chinampas, is mostly gone. And the habitat erasure actually starts with Spanish colonization. When the conquistadors swept through Mesoamerica, destroying civilizations and killing people in the name of colonial powers, they also filled in the swamplands and wetlands that the Chinampas and the Oxalatls relied on. 
but the destruction of wetland habitat that so many species and people rely on is not just a product of the colonialization of the early 15 and 1600s. This is actually a modern day problem since half of all global wetlands have been destroyed since 1900. Further threats such as pollution, habitat degradation, and droughts no doubt caused by human-induced climate change are further pushing the ocelots to extinction. Current population estimates of Ambistema mexicanum, the stereotypical ocelot, put the remaining individuals in the wild at anywhere from 50 to less than 1,000 total individuals. Now you may be wondering something kind of counterintuitive. You have very likely seen an ocelot at a pet store. You have very likely seen videos online of the ocelots. You have very likely been wondering through this video why there are so many in captivity, yet their numbers in the wild are facing dramatic decline. And you would be very correct to wonder. In captivity globally, there are over 1 million ocelotls that have descended from a single group taken from Mexico to Paris in the 1800s. In a bit of backstory, I used to buy and sell ocelotls. When I grew up in my family's pet store, I used to buy them by the hundreds from a guy. He would literally come in with milk jugs full of ocelots. They had water instead of milk, but no doubt we were actually partaking in the pet trade. And I was sold the false belief that, like many, if I breed these in captivity, I am helping them for conservation. Unfortunately, as much as I would love to believe that argument is valid, it does not work. It has never worked with any species, and it will continue to never work. In fact, the exotic pet trade is one of the largest issues facing species in the wild. Many of the individuals in captivity are either of poor health or are dramatically inbred. Many cannot be trafficked internationally across borders. And in my very honest opinion, the vast majority of people who say they are breeding them for conservation have zero plans to ever release them in the wild and are only doing so in order to make a profit. This is a quote from Luis Zambrano Gonzalez of the Ecological Restoration Laboratory at the Institute of Biology, uh, who has been working for over 20 years to actually save the Oshalals. It is not a species if it is not found in its habitat. We must conserve the species and let it reproduce in its natural ecosystem, which is in our own country. This is something I want you to keep in mind when you see ocelotos for sale, and you are considering purchasing them for $65, $70, hundreds of dollars, even thousands for designer morphs, is that this money is going to supporting breeders. This is going to supporting people of the exotic pet industry, not the animals that are going extinct in the wild. That amount of money could better be spent donating directly to the organizations and people working to save the ocelotls in the wild. And in fact, we already mentioned one of those people. Luis Zambrano from the National Autonomous University of Mexico has announced a re-up, a new fundraising campaign called Adopt Chalotl. This fundraising campaign acquires donations for the ocelotls directly for around 200 pesos, which is around $10 US. You can buy dinner for an ocelotl for 1,000 pesos, 50 US. You can actually spruce up their homes. And at larger donations, you can virtually adopt an ocelotl for six months or a year. Unfortunately, most news articles share no information about where to donate for the Adopt Chalotl program. Um, I've included a link, uh, this page here, which is says at the top, Adopt Chalotl is from UNAM. I hope this is the correct link, but I will update the video if it is not. And how is that money actually going to the Ocelotl conservation? What are the conservation efforts they are doing? Well, it goes back to the Chinampas. The biologists there are restoring the Chinampas in order to create agricultural products as well as ecological restoration. Pictured here are chinampas from this paper uh, titled The Integrating Agroecological Food Production, Ecological Restoration, Peasants' Well-Being, and Agri-Food Biocultural Heritage in Xochimilco City, Mexico City. Um, of course, Luis Zambrano is here. So this is what the money is going to, a full community conservation effort that factors in not only the species, but the people who depend on these habitats as well. Now, of course, it's going to take more than just restoring the chinampas in order to save the species. Scientists are also working on anti-pollution measures, removing invasive fish, and education in order to bring awareness about this incredible species. Personally, I want to see these species survive in the wild, not just in pet stores. Links for everything is down in the description, including where you can adopt a chalotl and donate to these organizations. 
Liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting, doing all of the interactions that you can do helps these videos gain more awareness and helps grow this channel. Thank you. Also, I completely meant to show that I have an Ashalal mug from the uh, San Diego Zoo uh, Wildlife Alliance. So yeah, I am a big, big fan of these species. <laughs> have a wonderful day.